Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the World Chess Championship 2021 between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomniši. I'm going to apologize first and foremost if the title spoils anything for you. Um, there was really no way to uh, name the video anything else considering this potentially might be our final time together. Um, Magnus Carlsen is up three games against Jan after 10 games of action, which means he's won three more, three to zero in the decisive games. Yesterday we had a rest day, and now it's up to Jan to see what he's going to do with the white pieces, considering that he has to go for the throat, he has to go for the win, and he begins with e4, which is actually surprising. Um, it's mostly surprising because Magnus has been relatively... Um, smooth sailing with black. I mean, he's not really getting challenged in e4, e5, so he goes back to e4, e5. And um, the, the, it, as far as I'm concerned, the mistake in this game happened as early as the second move. And you're going to be asking me, what the heck are you talking about? Well, um, what I'm talking about is the fact that Jan did not play the king's gambit. Jan played knight f3. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Jan should have played what, you know, he just made an opening course uh, on the King's Gambit. Uh, in reality, the King's Gambit at the highest level is borderline refuted. Um, yeah, I mean, Black is going to have absolutely no problems. I was joking, but uh, King's Gambit is very interesting at most lower levels. In fact, chess is just more interesting uh, at lower levels. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you guys, because you can actually get away with playing certain openings. Uh, but we see an Italian, so that is kind of our surprise. Uh, Jan chooses not to engage in a Rui Lopez. He goes for an Italian, and we get to see what Magnus prepares, knight f6. And now we um, we understand why Jan doesn't try to go for the fried liver with knight takes f7, because although the main line is very good, I'm sure that Magnus would have busted out a good old Traxler counter gambit. If you haven't watched my video on the Traxler, you are really missing out. Um, yeah, we're not going to get a fried liver in the World Championship match. Uh, instead, we have d3, and we have something known as the Gioco Pianissimo. Now, it's important to note, Magnus went with this move order, because who knows, may maybe Jan had prepared the Evans Gambit. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, the Evans Gambit obviously also equalized the top level with the black pieces, but it, it's interesting. I mean, and we've seen even top engines go for it, but we have to play a Gioco Pianissimo. Uh, d6, castles, just kind of regular standard stuff. Uh, up until this moment, uh, here, rather than castling, Magnus plays a5 right away. So, the the major thing is he's not castling. He's stomping white's queenside expansion. Just so you understand, castles, rook e1 supporting the center and preparing d4 to not be weak from this knight, uh, is how uh, many games go. In fact, there was a game, Alexienko, with the white pieces versus Anish Giri, which went a5 after castles. And that was played in the candidates. So that's like a very, very important game. So usually black will castle. But here, Magnus plays a5 before castling. Uh, and on rook e1, voluntarily retreats the bishop back to a7. So that it's not going to be a target um, for any of the queen side or central expansion points. Uh, and he also obviously is preventing anything from, you know, from, uh, from he prevents white from playing b4. Um, and uh, Magnus has played this twice before. He played this against Wesley So in the Opera Euro Rapid, uh, the online event. He also played this in Tata Steel against Jan Krzysztof Duda from Poland uh, in er earlier in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so this has been played before this specific move order, but it it's very rare. I mean, it's much more common for white to castle, uh, uh, for black to castle first. Knight a3. Knight a3 is played by Jan because uh, he's either going to get a knight to e3 by virtue of trading this bishop, or he's going to go to b5 and take uh, and, and try to get this bishop on a7. Now, the interesting thing is Jan has played like this before. Uh, he played knight b5, like something similar, uh, against Grishuk. So Jan has actually had this position on the board. Uh, maybe not this exact position, but at least with the knight on b5 and the bishop on b6. Uh, and, you know, he sort of tried to try to put some pressure on Grishuk like that by putting his knight on b5. But this time Jan thinks and, and, and drops the knight back to the c2 square. We have castles, bishop e3, and we have everything. The interesting thing is, now on move 11, we've transposed to another top level game. So almost no games are played here with this specific move order that we've seen in this game. But notice that black has castled now. So now that black castled on move nine, it kind of might transpose into black castling earlier in the game. And there's a game here played between Maxim Vachet Le Grave and Fabiano Caruana, 2018 in Paris. It was a blitz game. And uh, I think in that game, uh, uh, Caruana played bishop e6 or, or knight e7 to try to reroute his knight. And if you play knight e7, you're going to build for the center like this. Very common. 
So like very, very common for black to move that knight. If you've been following this match at all, you know that knight rotates and you know the center pawns will advance at some moment for black. In this game, Magnus plays rook e8 and now we are in brand new territory. Uh, Jan here plays a4. So the point of a4 uh, is, uh, first of all, you, you obviously are, are, are matching um, what's kind of going on on this side of the board. You're, you're not allowing black to play a4 and prevent you from ever playing queen b3. For example, like, like let's say you try to play queen b3 right now. Uh, believe it or not, th and, and it looks like you're attacking this, there is this. And if you take on f7 check, going for danger levels, your levels get dangered indeed. And your dangers get leveled, because now you're, there's a queen and a bishop hanging, you can't take the rook because you can't deal with your queen, you have to go here and probably just lose your bishop. So, Jan plays a4 himself, with the intention of most likely playing queen b3 in the future and not allowing black to expand on the queen side. Magnus plays the exact same maneuver right back, and now all the bishops have been traded, and this game is most certainly not paying homage to the Catholic Church. Uh, bishops are gone, and it's just horses and major pieces. Jan plays queen b3, attacking the pawn on b7, which can be protected like this, or by pushing it, um, or apparently you can just ignore it and just give it up and play rook b8, but Magnus is a practical gentleman and just moves the pawn forward one square, finishing the, uh, finishing the v-cut right here. Uh, so he's got a nice little thing going on there. Rook d1, knight e7, the knight is rotated. And now Magnus finishes his development with the move queen to d7 and rook to d8. And you notice that Jan, in his last two moves, uh, he played h3 to drop the knight back and move it to g4. Believe it or not, as absurd as this looks, it's actually relatively common for such positions. You might be used to seeing <coughs> things like knight h4, knight to f5. The problem is that if the knight even for a moment takes its eye off of the center of the board, black is going to go d5. In general, in positions like this, where everything is very closed, eight pawns each, you're looking at the pawn breaks of the position. Uh, otherwise, white, and, and for both sides, right? Otherwise, white will just march forward and dominate. Uh, because Jan has to play for a win, he has to do something. Or else Magnus will slowly improve his position to the maximum and he will do something. If Jan doesn't do something, Magnus will do something. Because Jan doesn't really have any advantage in this position, right? So it's kind of like the first person to grab the initiative will, uh, will push that initiative all the way through to the finish line. And um, that's the thing about closed positions, is that at some point a pawn break must occur. Uh, there's only so much maneuvering that you can succeed in. Uh, so rook d8 is coming to kind of push forward in the center, where black will have one, two, three, four pieces escorting the pawn. Jan, meanwhile, goes for this maneuver to try to trade this knight so that it doesn't support any advance, uh, any pushing toward the center. The problem is that after knight takes g4, if Jan plays the very kind of natural knight takes g4, um, I mean, d5 is still going to happen. And for example, ed5, queen d5, like you can't take this. Uh, black is just completely fine here. More than fine. I mean, if, if anyone's playing for any weakness attack, it's probably black. So Jan chooses to take with the h-pawn, but d5 is still on the board. And even when the dust settles, these rooks are going to battle for the e5 pawn. And uh, <clears throat> we might see mass simplifications, like just so you understand. For example, let's say we have ed5, knight d5. Queen d5, queen d5, knight d5, rook d5. I mean, this is completely unwinnable. You just, you're never going to win this position. Now, black is going to play f6 to support the pawn, double up on the d-pawn, you're going to defend it. Mutual zugzwang, mutual stalemate, mutual quagmire, mutual impasse, whatever you want to describe it as to flex your vocabulary, this is just going to be a draw. So, after d5, Jan plays d4, uh, and we have the kind of pawn square, and uh, the game is just heading for a draw. I mean, it, it, it's, it, Jan kind of did not get anything going. Magnus very calmly equalized. So we have E takes D4. Now he takes the corresponding pawn. Um, and uh, this, is my, this is a little tricky, of course. Like, if you take the knight, there is just a hanging rook. You need to be a little careful. I'm sure Magnus sees that. If you play knight takes d5 in this version, then after rook takes d4, I've pinned your knight to your queen, and now I'm much better, because if you try to hold everything together like this, uh, you don't. So, you know, put pressure on the pin piece, pp on the pp. Yes, that is an acronym that is very inappropriate if you are watching this with your children, but in this case, pp on the pp just means put pressure on the pin piece. There you go. I didn't make that up. Fun Master Mike did. Blame him. Chesskid.com. Free advertising. Uh, rook e4. So, just calculating this by Magnus, very nice and clean. Uh, rook gets out of the way, and if it's attacked in any way, it's just going to hang out on the f4 square. So, 
kind of like nice, you know, like for instance, CD4, knight d5 becomes possible because after knight d5, I'm going to throw in rook takes rook. So my knight is, com my, 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 my rook is completely safe in the center. If you play f3, you remove the defender of your knight and you lose the knight. So that's not going to happen. But queen c2, rook f4. And now Jan has a couple of options. Uh, of course, he really should be taking back here uh, with the pawn or the rook. I mean, most likely the rook, because again, if you take with a pawn, this is just an isolated pawn. So when everything transforms, white is just left with a terrible weakness in the center of the board. So what you can do to avoid that is you can play rook takes d4. And the difference here is that, Levy, you just said this is a terrible weakness. Yeah, but if you keep going after knight d5, queen d5, queen c7, white wins back pawn. And I mean, it's just, it, it's deadly symmetrical. Death in the position. But here, Jan Nepomnishi played the move g3. The move g3, according to the supercomputer, Sessi, I remember I had the tab open, the position went from 0, 0.00 to minus 11. What? 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 So, it's not exactly clear what Jan thought was going to happen here. Like, I mean, rook f3, for instance, just rook d4. Um, there is no other move here besides taking. Uh, I, and I think Jan spent nine minutes on g3. There's no other move, because if you go back, you're just going to lose this pawn. So, g3, the reason why apparently this is so brutal is that um, after pawn takes knight and pawn takes rook, there is this, and, and, and white is losing. White is losing, but it's, it's hard to see why. I mean, not for the Super GM commentators who were very critical of this, but it's a little hard to see why. So here's the thing. If you go to the corner, right, um, then, for example, there's... Uh, th there, there, actually, maybe it's completely interchangeable. Um, yeah, because even if you go to f1, the same thing happens. So just bear with me. Queen h3 check. So you cannot run to the middle because then I butcher you. You can't take because of this x-ray. And rook f1, I mean, I don't know. I play knight f5, rook e8, you resign. Your king is just stuck in the middle. So the same exact thing happens regardless of where you move your king. You have to go back. And here there is just a very clean winning variation. Very clean. Pawn takes f2. If takes with king, then this. So queen f2 and just rook d6. Like, just rook d6. If you take my knight, it's mate. I mean, it's literally mate. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, and if queen g2, just rook g6, for example. And it, it's over. I mean, I mean it's, it's just que it's queen and knight versus two rooks. I mean, the game is just completely lost. So Magnus was thinking here and didn't play it. He didn't play it. I... I don't understand what was, like, that was a two-move combo. That, that was not, I'm not sitting here like, oh, well, I would have found it. I mean, I'm just, like, just takes, takes, rook d6. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just don't. Uh, so the commentators were basically saying that he wasn't ready for such a gift on a silver platter or golden or platinum. I don't know. We're in Dubai. So, um, and so he just didn't even, uh, you know, sometimes you just, you just don't react. So knight f5 played. And knight f5 carries two threats, knight to h4 with knight f3 and queen g2 intentions, and I guess rook d6 also, because here Jan blitzed out d6, and now we see what's going on. So if rook takes d6 now, there is a trade of rooks, and that's sort of the problem. So Jan is kind of shoving the pawn forward as a way to potentially trade rooks, but also, also, if you're not completely careful here, um... There might be some lines where DC7 is possible. I'm just saying. It might be possible that, for example, here, 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 queen c2, d takes c7, and all of a sudden that pawn is an asset. And it's getting through. And if rook takes rook, white queens <laughs> with check. And you don't even win the game. So d6 is kind of tricky. D6 is a little bit tricky. Not when you are watching the game with an engine, because it's just sitting there like, yo, can we go home? Can we go home? Just resign, bro. Like, the engine is so brutal. Um, but uh, knight h4 is played, and rather than playing knight to f3 and allowing the king to go to f2, Magnus does something very Magnesian. He plays, knight, he plays queen g3 and knight f3, and he's threatening, uh, he's threatening to play queen h3 and uh, if the king goes up, then try to win this queen. Uh, but he's also just straight up threatening to, like, take the rook. I mean, he just has a million threats. Queen g1, queen g2. 
it, 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 everything, everything's a threat. Like, if you play DC7 now, it's made in two, because it's check here and the queen comes back. That's called, I like to call it the, the boomerang technique. Uh, and <clears throat> after this, he does this to force a queen trade on that square so that this is check. So that that's check. Whereas, had he done it this way, uh, then after knight e1, kaboom, kablam, and white is winning. White is winning because rook d8, c8, rook d1, c8, and it's just... So, he baits the queen this way, and then gets the trade, and now has rook and 6 versus rook and 5, but... More importantly, folks, what is the move for black here? What is the move that Magnus Carlsen played to apply pressure in this position with the black pieces? The move is, if you said h5, no. If you said king h7, no. Active rook. Rooks on the second and seventh rank. You need to get the rook behind. All right? You got to get behind everybody. Bull in a china shop. Wolf in a sheep's pen. Uh, something like that. I don't know. I'm not very good at sayings. Rook b1, rook b1, but now... Just g6, and black is just going to advance, and white cannot move. So rather than not moving, Jan chooses to move. He gotta go b4. Magnus can sneak around with rook a2, but that allows takes and the rook infiltrating. So he trades like this and sneaks the rook behind, freezing this rook, and he's just gonna push the h-pawn. So rather than sitting and suffering, Jan says, let's go. I got one king, he's got one life to live. YOLO, I'm gonna jump out of this plane. Let's do it. King to e4. Here comes h5, king to d5, here comes rook c2. Why rook c2? Well, you could go h4. You could go h4 and push this pawn. He chooses to play rook c2. Now, if rook c4 is played here, then um, he's going to go with this h4 thing. And, uh, and be because the thing is that when the king goes to take the pawn, you're not going to be able to win this as well. Uh, but he's winning in many ways. I mean, he he's winning in many, many ways. Uh, rook b3 played h4, the king's still going, h3, and the pawn's been stopped, but it hasn't, because you checked the king. Now, the only way you're going to push your a pawn is if you win this pawn. If you win that pawn, though, there is check. Magnus sacrifices the rook to clear the back rank, and the easiest way to defeat a king, rook, and pawn like this, it looks scary. To a beginner, this absolutely looks scary. Do not, I mean, you can still win, but don't do this. Don't put your queen in front of the pawn. That's the last thing you want to do. I mean, God forbid you accidentally allow like a, almost a, a, a completely saving, maybe even losing position. If you get really lucky, you find a way to lose this somehow. Don't do that. Queen's got to be active. It goes to the most active square. It creates threats as far as the king and the rook are concerned. If you try to get them close together, you lose both pawns. Once you lose both pawns, the game is obviously over. Although it does look kind of hard to stop. But... It, it, I promise you can stop it. You can give enough checks. You have to make all the pieces kind of stay close together or else you fork them and you're just much faster. You're just much faster. You always can create a lot of annoying threats, prevent the kind of pawn from moving forward. It's just winning. Uh, so, Jan goes king to a7. We have check. If you move the king up, I fork you and then I win your pawn. So we have this. King g7, because the queen wanted to give a back rank check, but it was not possible. So now the king steps off the back rank, rook b6, queen to c5, and Jan Nepomniachtchi resigned. He resigned because while he is able to defend both, he will lose both pawns, and rather than prolonging the agony, he resigns, and Magnus Carlsen wins the world championship match for a fifth time in his career by the score of 7.5 to three and a half. All right, if you made it this far in the recap, I love you. Thanks so much for hanging out with me all the time. The, usually the viewer attention is not that high toward the end of the video, but this is the final game of the match in 2021. Impressions, Magnus is a beast, but unfortunately the overwhelming storyline and the narrative before the match, which was one of the predictions came true, in, including by Magnus himself. People said that Jan is a brilliant player, but if he runs into a wall and has a bit of resistance, he has a tendency to, well, as Magnus described it in his own words, collapse. And he said that he can't afford that in this match. And that's exactly what happened. Exactly a week ago, we had the crazy game six, which went eight hours, 136 moves, and resulted in Jan losing. And since that game, he lost three more games and the match. I'm very sad in some ways. Um, that the match ended with that narrative. I, I really would have enjoyed a total flipping of the script, but that doesn't take away from anything that Magnus did. I mean, Magnus is still 
He is still a beast, and if he wins one more match, he ties the world record uh, with Garry Kasparov and maybe Lasker. So if he becomes a seven-time champion, he is the most dominant world champion of all time. Um, Jan will go back to the candidates. The loser of the match does get a spot in the candidates. Uh, and it's, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a shame it ended the way it did. Also, I feel like after this blunder during this game, uh, of uh, when, when Jan blundered G3, I feel like the narrative completely flipped on, uh, on Jan. So for a few games, people were feeling sad for Jan, which is kind of strange. Um, but like, uh, you know, they were just like, oh my God, uh, Jan blundering. Oh man, he's clearly not in shape. But after G3, I saw people were like fuming. They were like, oh, he just wants to go home. I saw all sorts of crazy stuff. He should stay off the internet for a few months. It's just really wild. I mean, what, what narratives exist about these players? Uh, yeah, people were now mad at him for playing G3 after blundering in two games. They were like mad at him. Uh, so that's what one thing I noticed. Um, yeah, I mean, that's those are kind of my impressions of the match. I just want to thank you guys for all the support. These videos have done better than any videos I've ever put out, and for good reason, for such an important event. Game 6 has almost a million views after publishing, so thank you all for your continued support. If you're new to the channel and you've only discovered my recaps, uh, you know, um, welcome. I've got a lot of other content, a lot of instructional content, which has been buried in recent months in some more fun content, but a uh, lot of interesting content on this channel, so do me a favor and subscribe. We've gained like almost 50,000 subscribers since the beginning of the World Championship match, so thank you all. And last but not least, uh, thank you to Eric Rosen. You should all go subscribe to his YouTube channel because I got the photos from my thumbnails from him. He was the photographer in Dubai. So what a better way to end the final few sentences of the World Championship coverage than thanking Eric Rosen. Wow. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming starting tomorrow. See you all. Get out of here.